Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so let's see, I'll start sharing my screen. We did experiment with this a little bit. Uh, let's see whether this works now. So now you should see some slides. Is that working? Yes, yes it is. Very good, okay. Good, well, uh, thanks very, very much for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be at least virtually in Africa. And I really, really hope that these weird times are over soon so that I can be back in person. Um, but I would also say that uh, having created this seminar, I think is a brilliant idea of everyone who was involved because if there's one good thing that will come out of these times, then it's exactly this, that we suddenly can connect more because we bought more equipment, we learned how to use Zoom and all that stuff. Um, and my personal dream is that indeed, this will be the main positive impact of this pandemic on mathematics in Africa. Um, because this always used to be the problem, that people were sitting spread out over this huge continent. And now we at least feel a little, little bit closer. Uh, okay, good. So I'll, I'll give a talk today um, where I'll mention current research at the very end. And this will be the African part. Uh, it will be sort of an ongoing project uh, with several of my PhD students, Angela Tabiri at the end, you know. Uh, with her, it all started. Uh, in the meantime, there was another PhD student, Manuel Martins, from Portugal, not from Africa, but the work we did actually took place in Ghana. Uh, and right now I'm working with Blessing Oni from Nigeria, currently in Trieste, uh, on a sequel paper to this story. But for the most time, I really intend to give a very mild introduction to the whole subject and give you some idea what this means, a quantum group. What is this? And um, well, there can be many, many answers to that. You can say in many ways what a quantum group is, and there have been different approaches over time. Um, and today I'll try to focus on one which I think is in a sense most elementary uh, because it avoids things like tensor products as much as possible. And it just uses elementary algebra but of course, what is elementary is very dependent on your background and what you know and what you want to know. So um, please feel free to interrupt me at any moment if there's a question and just ask, uh, and then I'll try to explain further. Okay, good. Let's start the show. Um, so we want to understand what a quantum group is. And obviously this means we just have to understand what is a group and what means quantum, and then we can go home right? Uh, and if I hear group, I usually think symmetry. You know, I think of pictures like the one you see here at the bottom of the slide, which is a pattern in the Alhambra in Granada, uh, a masterpiece of Islamic architecture and design from the medieval times. Um, and we see a pattern which shows a certain symmetry, uh, like my beautiful shirt does. And uh, well, if you want to explain what symmetry actually is, you would need that concept of a group. Um, but historically, historically, it really all started with Galois theory. So in the first five to 10 minutes, I want to repeat this story which happened, well, around 1830, um, because well, many people know of course what Galois theory is, but I personally, for example, I never did learn Galois theory as an undergraduate. I learned it in the meantime because I taught courses on it. Um, but when I started my PhD, I knew nothing about this stuff here. So in case you are in a similar situation, but also in case people are late five minutes, I thought I'd start with that. So the problem these people were thinking about was one of the most elementary ones math should fix, which is give me a polynomial f in one variable x with coefficients in a field k and for simplicity, no harm is done if you take this field to be the rational numbers. And you want to describe the set of roots of zeros. You want to solve the equation f of x equals zero. And in modern terms, what Galois understood was this. Um, he said, well, it's well possible that in the field k you start with, there are no solutions to the equation f of x equals zero. We'll see examples in a minute. But then you can always find a slightly larger field, the so-called splitting field of the polynomial. Let's call this capital A. And this splitting field um, can then be viewed as an algebra over K. 
I'll say in a minute what that means. And as such, it has a group of automorphisms. The automorphism group um, here, out Ka um, of this algebra A. Uh, so what are these automorphisms? Well, they are maps. They are maps sigma from A to A. Uh, and now it's time to recall what an algebra is. Well, it's a ring. So it's a set capital A, which has two binary operations called addition and multiplication. Um, so you can add elements of A, you can multiply elements of A in some way, and they satisfy the ring axioms. So under addition, it should be an abelian group. Under multiplication, it might just be a semi-group and it might not be commutative. Um, and on top, on top, it contains the ground field K as a subring. It contains the ground field K as a subring, which means that we cannot just multiply arbitrary two elements in the algebra. We can also take an element in A and multiply it by a scalar, by an element in K. And in this way, the algebra also becomes a vector space. So an algebra is a ring which at the same time is a vector space. And then an algebra automorphism should be a map sigma from the algebra to itself which is invertible, it's bijective, and it respects the full structure of the algebra. Meaning if I take sigma of A plus B, it should be sigma of A plus sigma of B, it's an additive map. If I take sigma of A times B, it should be sigma of A times sigma of B, it's a multiplicative map. And then it should be compatible with this K-linear structure, with a vector space structure, uh, and one way to say that is it should fix the ground field. So if I take lambda from K, if I take lambda from K, then sigma of lambda should be lambda. Uh, and an easy exercise is that from this, you can deduce that sigma is in fact a K linear map on A viewed as a vector space over K. Good. So Galois said, give me a polynomial, build a certain algebra, and out of that, look at the symmetries of this algebra, meaning the automorphism group, and study this. And using abstract group theory to study this group will allow you to answer any question you can have about roots of polynomials. So for example, we could take a polynomial like x squared plus one, okay? And then that's such a case where over the rationals or the reals, there are no solutions. There is no number lambda such that lambda squared plus one is zero. Um, but what you can do is you just invent the number. You invent a number i, which is supposed to be a root of this polynomial. Um, now you can say this in two ways. You could be an analyst and say there are the complex numbers. And in the complex numbers, there exists this weird thing i with i squared is minus one. And inside the complex numbers, I can then take all linear combinations of one and i with rational coefficients. So all numbers of the form lambda plus mu i, where lambda and mu are rational numbers. And then you can check that this is a field, usually denoted by q at joint i. It's the smallest subfield of the complex numbers, which contains i. Um, but if you are not an analyst, you are a pure algebraist, you could also say, I construct this by simply treating i as some kind of variable, which however satisfies the relation i squared is minus one. So more abstractly, you can take the polynomial ring in x with coefficients in q, and uh, you take the ideal generated by the polynomial x squared plus one, meaning all the multiples of this polynomial, that's an ideal. Uh, the polynomial x squared plus one is irreducible from this one deduce that this ideal is maximal and from this one sees that uh, this is a field, okay? And in this way you create this extension field A of K and you study its group of automorphisms and there are only two, the identity, which is always an automorphism and then there's complex conjugation. Now you can take uh, any complex number and take its complex conjugate and that will be such an automorphism of this algebra. And these are all, as an abstract group, the group of automorphisms, and called the Galois group of this field extension or of this polynomial, is Z2. And from here, you can now start answering, answering questions. For example, one knows now by the main theorem of Galois theory that there are no field extensions in between Q and Q at joint I, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but where the story really got interesting and was able to answer questions one couldn't answer is if you look at polynomials like this here, x to the 5 minus 6, 6x plus 3. Uh, if you start with this polynomial and you do the full procedure, it's a little bit more cumbersome, a little bit more tedious, but you will find at the end that the automorphism group of the splitting field is the full permutation group, S5, the symmetric group of all permutations of five elements. And then one of the features of this group is that it is not solvable. Now, there's a term in group theory, what it means that a group is solvable. Um, and the origin of this term is this story here. Because what Galois understood is that if the group that you get doesn't have that property, well, then there won't be a formula for the roots of your polynomial. No, for a polynomial of degree two, three, or four, you can write down formulas. Now, if you have x squared plus px plus q is zero, then you know, well, x is p half plus minus square root of p squared four minus q. Okay, and such a formula exists also in degree three, in degree four, but not in degree five. People were searching for this for centuries. There had been competitions where people were thrown polynomials at, and then they had to come up with solutions. Um, and Galois understood that, well, for this equation here, there is no formula. But to rigorously prove this, you need all this stuff. You need to think about the group of symmetries of this algebra, and you need to develop abstract group theory. And when you do this, you can say this. OK, good. So this was a little bit of Galois theory to start with. Um, and now we know what groups are. Now, what is quantum? What is quantum? Well, we have to skip 100 years in time. Uh, and Heisenberg, Born, Jordan, and a few others uh, developed in 1925 a new model for the hydrogen atom. Now, some of you might hope and others might fear that I now descend or ascend into physics, um, but I can tell you I won't. Okay, this, this slide will be the only physics in this talk. Um, but okay, what did these guys do? They looked at the hydrogen atom and the classical model was that there was a nucleus and there was an, an electron orbiting this nucleus formed by a proton, the nucleus. <clears throat> and well, classical mechanics wasn't able to describe the system very well. There were certain experiments which just didn't match uh, the predictions from classical mechanics. So these guys came up with a new model. Uh, they first learned what matrices are. This was still brand new back then. And uh, well, whenever you throw any piece of new mathematics at physicists, they start to build models of something using this. Um, so they said, well, maybe we can build a model describing the hydrogen atom uh, in which the observables the things we can see and measure are not given by numbers. You know, classically, you would say a physical system has certain observable quantities like temperature, pressure, the electron orbiting will have an angular momentum, for example. Uh, and classically, these are numbers. But they said, well, we build a model in which these are matrices. Matrices whose indices are the energy levels of the system we describe. And they set up a model uh, which was better. Uh, and which still today, well, is at least within a certain realm, uh, a very, very accurate model of the hydrogen atom. Uh, and well, the only thing which to this talk is relevant is that this passage to matrices in particular means that the observables do not commute any longer. If you multiply two matrices, it matters in which order this, this is taking place. And in physics, this leads to uh, uncertainty principles. You know, the fact that certain observables cannot be measured accurately at the same time. <clears throat> we don't care about this in maths. Uh, in maths, we want to understand the algebraic implications of non-commutativity. And well, if you want to see this, there is a beautiful talk by Angela online uh, on, well, pretty much the same research in which she uh, gives you a graphical explanation of this by dancing. Uh, now, some of you might now hope or fear that I start dancing, but again, I won't. I won't. Good. Okay. So, 
That's what quantum is about. It's about matrices. It's about passing from commutative numbers. So as an algebraist, I would say elements of fields and rings to matrices. And if you take this and you take the previous slide on Galois theory and you just throw the two things together, it's pretty clear what quantum groups should be about. Uh, it should be about symmetries uh, where matrices occur. Uh, so we would start to study K-algebra morphisms not from A to A, where A is now any algebra you like over any field K you like. We study algebra morphisms sigma, which go from A to the N by N matrices over A of some size N. Okay, so what does that mean? It means it's a map which takes an element small a uh, from my algebra a, and it produces a matrix with entries in a. So there are entries which I denote by sigma one one of a, sigma one two of a, and so on, down to sigma and n of a. And the whole thing should be an algebra morphism. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means in equivalent terms the following. It means we have these sigma ij's. So what does a single sigma ij do? Well, it takes an element small a from a and it produces a new element, sigma ij of a. So each single entry sigma ij of sigma is a map from a to a. And um, the addition and the scalar multiplication in the algebra of matrices is component wise, entry wise, which means that for the whole thing to be a k-linear map, we need that all these sigma ij's are k-linear. The complicated part of matrices is when we start multiplying them. Uh, so to say that sigma is an algebra morphism means that sigma of ab is sigma of a times sigma of b. But this sigma of a times sigma of b now takes place here. And if you work out what that means, you need precisely this condition down here. Uh, so it says that a single sigma ij, when you evaluate it on a product of a times b, a and b coming from capital A, you can rewrite this as this expression here. So the goal is find such sigmas, i.e. find such sigma ij's. And I will call these quantum symmetries. Okay, uh, any questions up to here? No one. Okay. Good. Um, here's a simple example to give you an idea of what can go on. Uh, suppose you give me two actual symmetries of the algebra A, meaning algebra, automorph uh, algebra morphisms, um, and you give me a derivation, a twisted derivation. So this is a k-linear map partial from A to A, which satisfies the Leibniz rule. So partial of AB is this here, so it's a Leibniz rule where rho and tau come in. It's rho of A partial of B plus partial of A tau of B. Now, in particular, if you like, you take rho and tau to be the identity, then the right-hand side is the actual untwisted Leibniz rule. A times partial of B plus partial of A times B. And if, if delta, if partial satisfies this, then you can directly check that this map sigma is indeed an algebra morphism. So you take an element, aha, I forgot an A maps to, sorry. So this should say small a is mapped to, well, this matrix here, it's an upper triangular matrix. On the diagonal, you do these actual symmetries, these actual morphisms from A to A, but you place the partial of A in the upper right corner. And this will indeed be such a quantum symmetry. And well, if you do this for a few years, you start thinking, yes, this, this smells quantum. It smells as if this partial of A is like a small correction to a diagonal matrix. You know, the diagonal matrix itself is like, well, there are two symmetries, rho and tau, actual algebra automorphisms or something like this. But then there is a partial in the upper right corner which connects the two. Uh, I mean, derivations in algebraic geometry would be vector fields or in differential geometry, the same thing. The, the, the derivations of the smooth functions on a compact manifold are just the vector fields on that manifold. And vector fields are like ordinary differential equations, which is like infinitesimal versions of diffeomorphisms, of automorphisms, of symmetries. Now, which means that indeed this thing up here is a tiny correction 
to an actual pair of symmetries of A. Good. Okay. Well, uh, there's one thing I didn't mention so far, which is invertibility. Well, I, I said in the beginning, an automorphism should be an invertible map. We want an actual group, and we all know groups are those guys where we have inverses of elements. And in Galois theory already, it's absolutely clear if you drop this, if you consider uh, map sigma, which are not invertible, you won't learn enough. A symmetry needs to be invertible. And well, here, of course, the question is, how do I do this? If I have such a map from A to the two by two matrices over A, that, that cannot be invertible. The, the things don't match up in size, right? So uh, it seems at first that there is a bit of problem here. Um, but note, um, if we call the set of K linear maps from A to A, capital E. So these are the endomorphisms of A as a vector space. That's also an algebra. Okay, it's the algebra of all k linear maps from A to A. And we said that these sigma ij's, these entries of the matrix up here, huh? they are in fact k linear maps. So I can treat this entire matrix as a matrix with entries in E. Yeah, I can say, well, th the map sigma is like this here, but I leave A open. And if I leave A open, then on the right hand side, I have an n by n matrix. And the entries of this matrix are elements, well, precisely in the algebra of all linear maps from A to A. And of course, I now can demand that this matrix is invertible in M N of E. Okay, so I would call sigma invertible if sigma is in fact in GLN of E. It's an invertible matrix. Okay, good, good, good. So. Um, well, there's a problem here. Invertibility of matrices behaves really, really odd when the ring you consider is non-commutative. And the ring of endomorphisms of a vector space is always non-commutative. Okay, so GLN of E is still a group. That's fine. Uh, but the first thing you should realize is that you can completely forget about anything with determinants. You know? So statements such as a matrix is invertible if its determinant is non-zero or invertible doesn't work any longer. Yeah? Debt is no longer good. And in a similar spirit, uh, invertibility and taking transposes behaves really, really weird. So you can have the situation that you take a matrix sigma, which is invertible, but its transpose is not. Yeah? So down here, you see a simple example. Take any ring E, uh, which contains two elements A and D, and D times A is one, and a times D is not one. In non-commutative rings, this can happen. And then you can easily check that the matrix A, one, zero, D is invertible, but its transpose is not. Its transpose is not. And in fact, also, if you compute the inverse of this matrix, you get this. It's D minus one, one minus A, D, A. And see, this lower left corner here is also weird. If you think about normal matrices with complex entries, the inverse of an upper triangular matrix should be upper triangular again, okay? But if you go non-commutative, that's not true. Um, but, but again, if I look at this matrix, I again think this smells quantum. Yeah? So we have these two guys, A and D here, and A times D is not one, but D times A is one. So one minus AD tries hard to be zero, uh, it's just about the non-commutativity of A and D, uh, which tells us that it may happen that one minus A, D is not zero. So again, these phenomena that we see here uh, become sort of plausible or feelable to me if, if I think about this lower left corner as something very small. And I could place H bars here to make this plausible, but then it again would sound as if I do physics, which I don't. Uh, okay, yeah. so if I want to define invertibility of my quantum automorphisms, this is a bit weird, and this will have implications. Yeah, when I develop the theory of these sigmas, this is a problem. So, um, so yes, what's a times d? It's not uh, one, so maybe it's 
So, mm -hmm. what the, yeah. So, for example, you could take. Okay, let me see whether this works. Uh, do you see some some empty? Yeah. yeah okay. So, see, you, you can talk about the vector space A of all made, of all sequences. Uh, well, the sequence is uh, x one, x two, x three, and so on. Take this vector space. So, like an, an R to the infinity, if you want to. Uh, and now you could have a map. Uh, first map takes such a sequence x1, x2, x3, and so on, and it shifts it to the left. It drops the x1 and it gives me an x2, x3, x4, and so on. Second map takes such a sequence, but it shifts it to the right, uh, and it puts a zero here. Okay, now you see, well, if I first do the second map and then I do the first, I get back my original sequence. So if I call this, which way around do I want it? I want DA to be one, right? I want DA to be one. So if we call this map here uh, D and this map A, then D and A are linear maps on this vector space A. So they are linear maps on this vector space A. And if I first do A and then I do D, I get the identity map, which is the element one in this ring. But if I first do D and then A, I do not get one. So the linear maps on an infinite dimensional vector space form a ring in which you will find elements A and D such that D times A is one, but A times D is not one. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And if you take such a ring and you look at these elements AD, then I can now build, and this is the confusing bit, it's it's a matrix, but the entries of the matrix are also things like linear maps on a big vector space also. Huh? And this matrix, when we then talk about the invertibility of such matrices, weird stuff is happening. Good. But thanks for the question. As I said, uh, this is what I hate about Zoom talks, right? I mean, I, I stand in front of the screen and talk against the wall. And after 20 minutes, one just thinks one goes nuts, right? And because the normal situation is that you see all these beautiful people in front of you. Uh, so every question which comes out of nowhere is very, very welcome. Good, okay. So um, that's that. Uh, and in fact, I added a slide uh, for the ring theorists, which I know there is a lot of interest in Uganda on such things. Um, uh, there is in fact a quite recent result by Lam uh, and Gupta and Kurana and Kurana, 2009, which says that in fact this, this, this problem that the transpose of an invertible matrix might not be invertible characterizes non-commutativity. Now, if you take any algebra whatsoever um, and you ask, whether all invertible matrices have an invertible transpose, then this happens if and only if, I'm tempted to say the algebra is commuted, if that's not quite true. There's something called the radical of an algebra, which is the Jacobson radical, which is the intersection of the annihilators of the simple left modules. If you don't know what that means, just forget about it. Yeah? Think about some, something you want to get rid of anyway. And the statement is that E modulo its radical is commutative if and only if we have that property that for all square matrices which are invertible, the transpose is invertible. So for example, this can be used to characterize commutative division algebras, so fields among all division algebras. Now, if you, if you assume my, my ring E is a division algebra, meaning every non-zero element is invertible, um, then if you have any two elements A and B, which do not commute, uh, next example, take the matrix 1, A, B, A, B. It will always be invertible, but the transpose will not be invertible. Uh, and to work out these examples is actually quite tricky. So if you anyway are going to teach an example, a uh, course on non-commutative rings or something like this, um, these are very nice exercises to give your students to. Okay. So, well, um, 
I want to introduce some terminology here, which I'm sure has already a name somewhere in the literature, but I couldn't find it and Blessing also couldn't find it. And I asked a bit around and no one knows so far. Um, I want to call matrices strongly invertible if this problem disappears, meaning I can apply the operation of taking the inverse and the transpose as often as I want. Uh, and I always stay invertible. Uh, um, if anyone knows a name for this, has seen this somewhere in a book, please let me know. Um, you know but so technically speaking, this is a, a definition. You know? So we take some subset of the GLN over some ring E closed under taking inverses and taking transposes. Well, if we have such a subset, then I call the elements of this subset strongly invertible. And here is an example of nice, well-controlled, uh, strongly invertible matrices. If you look at upper triangular matrices, we had seen an example of upper triangular matrices which are invertible, but not strongly invertible. And this was about the diagonal behaving oddly. Um, but I claim that if, um, if we take an upper triangular matrix, it will be strongly invertible precisely when all the elements on the diagonal are actually invertible in E, huh? if, if this is the case. And well, in this case, the inverse is already, is again upper triangular. So this problem which we saw also doesn't occur. Now, so what I try to advertise here is that uh, over non-commutative rings E, uh, really nice invertible matrices are those which are upper triangular and the diagonal elements are invertible. And all those problems then go away. Good. Um, well, and now we slowly get to the point what a quantum group is. Um, so I say, if I have an algebra A and I take such sigmas, which go from A into the n by n matrices over A, and I view them as such a map and they are algebra morphisms, but when I view them as matrices with entries in the linear maps from A to A, they are strongly invertible. In that case, I would call sigma a quantum automorphism or a quantum symmetry of the K-algebra A. Okay, and those are the things I want to understand. Those are the things I want to understand. Um, sorry, Mark, you now want to see what is a quantum group. Well, I will sort of checking out, I won't tell you. Uh, I will make one remark, which is if you give me a quantum automorphism, um, its inverse as a matrix in GLNE is in general not a quantum automorphism. Now the inverse is again strongly invertible, but it won't be an algebra morphism. It will be an algebra morphism from the opposite of A to the N by N matrices over the opposite of A. No, sorry, from the opposite of A to MN of A. But if you then take the transpose, things work out. So um, I didn't say that. Well, statement is as on the slides, if you take the inverse of the matrix and you transpose, then you will again get a quantum automorphism, which I denote by sigma bar. So if, if I'm just talking about one by one matrix, then it's an ordinary automorphism and the sigma bar is the inverse. So the sigma bar is some sort of fancy quantum analog of taking the inverse of the group element. And there's also some sort of group product. Um, however, you have to change the size of the matrices. Now, if you give me two quantum automorphisms, one landing in n by n matrices, and the second one tau landing in m by m matrices, um, then I can do a Kronecker product of the two. So I get a matrix of size n times m times n times m, and the entries of these matrices are labeled with double indices. So there's an I1 and an I2 and a J1 and a J2. And I1 and J1, they pick an entry of tau and I2 and J2 pick an entry of sigma. And then I just take the ordinary composition of these two as a map from A to A. And in this way, I get a new quantum automorphism. Again, if I just talk about one by one matrices, so M equals N equals one, then this is just the ordinary composition of automorphisms. So it's the group structure. Yeah. But in general, the situation is slightly more tricky. Yeah. And that's why I will not give you a definition saying a quantum group is blah, 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 blah. Um, I leave it like that. 
And I say, well, you can talk about quantum automorphisms. You could, of course, now take systems of quantum automorphisms which are closed under these top two operations. Fair enough. Um, they would not form a group. Well, otherwise we wouldn't need a new name, right? They form something which feels slightly like a group, but it has some quantum feature in it, which is this n by n matrices. Okay, but I would say this is a very good definition of, or, or a very good motivation for what a quantum group is. It's, it's something which is not quite a group, but it consists of something which is not quite an automorphism. It's a quantum automorphism. And then we are very, very close to the original spirit of Galois theory. Good. Um, right, let's see an example. Let's go back to our original situation. And I claim that this can even start to occur in classical field theory. So this is an example due to Greit and Paragis from the mid eighties. And they said, well, take again the rational numbers, take a fourth root of two in the real numbers. You know, the positive real numbers such that its fourth power is two. Take the field you obtain by throwing that into Q. So you take the smallest subfield of the real numbers containing this fourth root of two and the rationals. Uh, this will just be all the linear combinations of this fourth root of two, its square and its cubed with coefficients in the rationals. And this field will have interesting quantum automorphisms. Yeah. In particular, there's a unique quantum automorphism of this form. It lands in the two by two matrices and it maps an element A from the field to a matrix of this form. So in fact, sigma one one and sigma two two, they agree. They are given by a certain map C, which goes from A to A and sigma one two is minus sigma two one. And it's some map S, which goes from A to A. Uh, and there is a, a, a unique quantum automorphism of this form with the properties that C on that fourth root of two is zero and S on that fourth root of two is minus fourth root of two. So if we would like to prove this claim, uh, we would have to understand again, what does that mean that this thing is a quantum automorphism? Well, first of all, it has to map the unit element of A to the unit element of this algebra here, i.e the identity matrix, one, zero, zero, one, which means C and S must be maps, which map one to one, respectively one to zero. And then in addition, sigma of AB must be sigma of A times sigma of B. And if you work that out, so you multiply two such matrices here, once with A's and once with B's, and you equate that to the same type of matrix, but with AB everywhere, then you see that you get these formulas here, that C of A must be C of A times C of B minus S of A times S of B, and S of A, B must be C of A, S of B plus S of A, C of B. And in this way, once you know C and S on A and on B, you know it on AB. And this gives you a feeling why indeed, just knowing these two values, you can conclude all the other values. And you will also find that these linear maps, C and S, satisfy C squared plus S squared is one, and C S is S C is zero. So you get some sort of quantum group here, some quantum symmetry, and it seems to have to do with sine and cosine, right? This is why C and S, because they satisfy the equations that sine and cosine satisfy. Um, but it's not a quantum, a classical symmetry. You know, this, this thing is weird, but it exists. And we can say even more, um, well, this field, A, this field is, is a bad one from the point of view of Galois theory. Why? I said in Galois theory, you start with your equation, like F equals X to the four minus two, and you want to talk about its roots. And the first thing you do is, well, you find the splitting field of this polynomial. But this A is not the splitting field of this polynomial. There will be complex roots of this polynomial, which are not contained in A. It contains some roots of the polynomial, but not all. And in fact, this field is not the splitting field of any polynomial. And in fancy words in Galois theory language, one would say the field extension from the rationals to this is not a Galois extension. Or also known, it's not a normal extension. It's separable, but it's not normal. Um, 
And Galois would then say, well, then I can't make any statements about this field extension. Um, but using this quantum symmetry, we can go a little bit towards Galois theory because we can say, well, take the subalgebra of E, which is generated by these two linear maps C and S, call that capital H. Um, then there is something which resembles a result in Galois theory called the normal basis lemma, which would say that the, the extension is a Galois extension. But instead of the Galois group, these automorphisms, this H creeps in. And to make the statement precise, you should also view A, the field itself, as a subring of E, where you just identify an element of A with the multiplication operator from A to A it defines. Yeah, so we get a map yota from A to E, and yota of A, A, a fixed element in A, is the map from A to A, which maps B to A times B. So now A sits inside of E, and H also sits inside of E, and the statement that this is a Galois extension is that there is a basis of H as a k-vector space, which at the same time is a basis of E as an A module, viewing A as a subring of E. Or if you like that better, uh, write down this map here. This is where tensor products become helpful, but some people really don't like them. So I try to avoid them uh, in this talk, not in my papers, but in this talk. So you write down the map gamma, which goes from A tensor H to E, and it basically multiplies. It's the multiplication map of E. So you take a small A and a small H, and you assign to this tensor the map, which sends B to A times H of B. And this map is a bijective map. Uh, and that is the definition of A being a Galois extension for this quantum symmetry given this quantum automorphism given by sigma. But the confusing thing is that you will find other quantum automorphisms for which the same story also holds. Now, in classical Galois theory, you give me a field extension and then there is the group of all field automorphisms and that group, well, either does the job or it doesn't. Whereas here, it can be that a given Algebra A is a Galois extension for different symmetries, it seems. Now, and that's a bit confusing. And also, well, in Galois theory, we get all these nice theorems once we know we have a Galois extension, and here we don't. Now, there are some results which generalize to this Galois case, Galois setting with quantum symmetries, but all this is still ongoing research. Now, so one doesn't know how all of Galois theory extends to this setting here. Good, okay. So on this slide, um, I sort of wrap up, uh, wrap up what I said so far. Um, there was this H. This H is a certain algebra and all those property it has uh, mean it's a so-called Hopf algebra. And I won't tell you what that is. It's a certain type of algebra which acts on this algebra A. Um, and one way to say the whole story in more, more modern technology is to say that there is a Hopf algebra H which acts on A. A becomes a module algebra over H. And well, if the quantum symmetries that we lose, the quantum automorphism are all upper triangular, which I said is sort of the best case, then this Hopf algebra is pointed. Yeah? And pointed Hopf algebras are certain algebras which are studied by many, many people these days for all sorts of reasons. Now, there are many, many other motivations for studying Hopf algebras. And some people would just say a quantum group is the same as a Hopf algebra. Other people would say certain types of Hopf algebras are quantum groups. So, um, so certainly when you start to search for quantum groups, the word Hopf algebra will appear very soon. Yeah? But the story I told you up to here um, sort of avoided that term Hopf algebra because for Hopf algebras, you need to use tensor products from the start. And it all looks a bit weird, but it boils down to what I told you. But if we start with this perspective, then the real question is, if you give me an algebra A over a field K, well, which Hopf algebras H can act on this algebra A? Um, is there some sort of largest one, a universal Hopf algebra which acts? Um, 
And if I take certain hop fibroblasts, when will this Galois condition be satisfied? Now, that's the type of questions which a certain group of researchers asks here. And that's what we want to understand in this project. And there's a, a different point of view, which is category theory, uh, where you would say, well, um, an algebra A is the same as a monoid in a certain tensor category, namely the category of vector spaces over a field. But then there are all kinds of weird tensor categories. And to view an algebra with quantum automorphisms on them means to study monoids in such more complicated tensor categories, which have a forgetful functor F to vector spaces. And the translation between the two pictures is this. If you give me a hop algebra H, then it has a category of representations of modules. And this is a tensor category with certain addition properties. Uh, and um, so saying that the hop algebra H acts on an algebra A means just that A becomes a monoid in that tensor category. But also conversely, if you have a tensor category and you have such a forgetful functor to vector spaces, you can always reconstruct a Hopf algebra by a process called tanaka krein reconstruction. Um, so these two things, tensor categories and Hopf algebras, are very much related. And another current area of research is to sort of ask, well, what if we don't have such a forgetful functor? And then you get slightly more general tensor categories, where you can also maybe say that monoids in there are like algebras with, with symmetries, which are even more quantum than of the sort I'm looking at. Okay, good. Um, so just roughly five minutes left, I guess. Um, and in those five minutes, I want to talk about really the stuff we did in these projects. And it's a natural question to ask from the perspective that I gave you on these quantum groups. I said, well, the whole story started with study a polynomial F and its roots, a polynomial F in one variable, well, in algebraic geometry, you start by saying, okay, let's do many polynomials in many variables. Yeah? So study the joint solution set capital X of a set of polynomials F1 up to Fm, which are polynomials in N variables. Yeah? So for example, if you have just one polynomial F1, which is X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared minus one, written as X1 squared plus X2 squared plus X3 squared minus one, that's a polynomial with real coefficients. And we get the joint, so just the solutions to the equation f1 equals zero. Um, well, that's the two sphere. Yeah, so the joint solutions of polynomials in many variables will generate certain geometric objects embedded into k to the n, called algebraic sets or affine varieties. Um, and many geometric spaces we study can be realized in this way. In fact, every smooth manifold can be embedded into some Rn using a finite list of polynomial equations. That's Nash's embedding theorem. Uh, so this, this theory is at least as general as differential geometry. Um, okay, but the trick, why is it called algebraic geometry? Well, because one doesn't study this X as a point set. We do exactly the same thing somehow that we did in Galois theory. Um, it's just that now there is no field extension um, that describes X. But we can still, we can say something which, if you think about it, is the same as we did in the Galois theory. We take polynomials f um, and we associate to them functions from x to k, because if you give me a polynomial in n variables and you give me a point small x uh, in my set capital X, well, then this point has coordinates lambda 1 up to lambda n. I can plug them into f. I get a number. And in this way, polynomials f give me functions on my set X. And the functions of this sort are called, regu are called regular or polynomial functions. And the ring of all these is called the coordinate ring of X. And this is an algebra over K, and we want to study this in algebraic geometry. And um, well, the first major theorem one usually proves in a course on commutative algebra or algebraic geometry is Hilbert's North standards, which really says precisely what this correspondence between these algebras and these geometric spaces is. Um, and it only works for algebraically coast fields really well. Um, so there's a first point which describes these coordinate rings in terms of the defining equations, f1 up to fm of the space. Uh, you can take the ideal in the polynomial ring generated by these. 
So simply all the linear combinations of F1 up to Fm with coefficients in the polynomial ring, um, well, these are certainly functions which vanish on X, but then you need to take the so-called radical of this ideal. Uh, so you take all the F such that some power of this F lands in this ideal. And you again get an ideal. Take the quotient of the polynomials by this. This is, as an abstract algebra, this K of X. Okay, so this completely describes K of X as an algebra. From this, we can see what algebras arise in this way. It's precisely the finitely generated commutative algebras, which have no deal potent elements. So they are reduced, as one would say. And so from that perspective, we can say, okay, whether we talk about X, or about a finitely generated commutative algebra without nil potents, that's the same thing. And um, well, how do you get back your x from this algebra? You get it as the set of maximal ideals. Yeah? The point is every x, small x in capital X, a point in my space, defines an ideal in this ring, the functions which vanish in the point. That's a maximal ideal. So you get a map from capital X to what's called the maximal spectrum of this algebra, the set of maximal ideals. And the high point of the null stands out is this is a bijection. Uh, so you can describe your X as these maximal ideals. Okay, and now one can ask, what are the quantum symmetries of such coordinate rings, Kx? And uh, there were some negative results. So Ettinger and Walton in 2014 um, they showed that there are very few quantum symmetries if you add an adjective which is semi-simple. Um, we now need this Hopf algebra viewpoint. Um, now, I was a little bit unclear about this in the past. I said, well, there are these sigma ij's and they generate a Hopf algebra h inside E. Um, that's a pretty restrictive viewpoint, you know, which one wants to leave soon because typically if you want Hopf algebras which actually completely live inside E, i.e. which act faithfully on A, A is a faithful module over this ring, then you don't find many. But you can have a slightly weaker condition to find more interesting Hopf algebras. And in this case, you say, well, the Hopf algebra is not generated by these sigma ij's themselves, but by some abstract variables sij, which act by the sigma ij's on my algebra A. Um, and they generate a Hopf algebra, which then acts on A. Yeah. Uh, and if I can't quotient to a smaller Hopf algebra, which still acts on A, uh, then one would say the Hopf algebra acts inner faithfully on uh, my algebra. And what Chelsea and Pasha proved is that, well, if you want the, such Hopf algebras to be semi-simple, I won't say what that means, but many of you will know and the others don't worry, um, then at least if you work over a field of uh, characteristic zero, which is algebraically closed, and the coordinate ring on which you act has no zero divisors, which means that the set X is an affine variety, it's irreducible, um, then there are no interesting inner faithful uh, Hopf algebra actions by semi-simple Hopf algebras. More precisely, the only ones which exist are those where you have an actual group of classical automorphisms, no quantum acting on this. But okay, this means maybe there are very few quantum symmetries, but this adjective semi-simple in the language of Hopf algebras is sort of the opposite of this adjective pointed, which I threw at you in the past, where I said, look at triangular, upper triangular matrices. They will generate pointed Hopf algebras. And in the world of Hopf algebras, pointed is sort of the opposite of semi-simple. Like in the category of Lie groups, semi-simple or reductive is the opposite of solvable. And um, yeah, so, um, so one can study maybe pointed Hopf algebras acting on coordinate rings, and then suddenly there are many quantum symmetries. And I wrote a paper in 2012 uh, where I looked at completely different questions, but in an example, I noticed, well, if you take this curve here, the so-called cusp, given by the equation x cubed is equal to y squared, um, then this curve, has many, many quantum symmetries. And this curve is, of course, not a smooth manifold. It has a singularity in the point zero. And well, what does that mean? It means that there's a point which is special. 
And if one thinks a little bit about this, this will mean that any actual automorphism, uh, any symmetry of this algebra A, which is now just the symmetry of this space that you can see, um, has to fix this point. Now, and in fact, all the symmetries look like this. You rescale your first variable x1, which I called x, by lambda squared, and the second by, by, by lambda cubed. Now, so there are very few symmetries. Um, but in that paper, I showed that there are many quantum symmetries. And to say precisely what that means would certainly take more time than the few minutes I have. And I think some of you anyway know this, and the others maybe don't really care. That's fine. Yeah? But, um, but this is what one calls a quantum homogeneous space. And the technical statement would be there is such a Hopf algebra, and I can embed my ring Kx as a subalgebra into that Hopf algebra with an additional property. It's a so called right co ideal, whatever that means. Um, using this, you can then construct many quantum automorphisms of this ring. And uh, there's a certain little addition. Uh, the big Hopf algebra should be faithfully flat as a module over this subring. Uh, and if this big Hopf algebra was commutative, it isn't in this case. Well, then all this would just mean that there is a certain algebraic group G and the coordinate ring of that would be this big Hopf algebra and X would be a quotient of this G by a closed subgroup. It would be a coset space, i.e. we would have a transitive action of this algebraic group. Yeah? And in this sense, this notion of a co-ideal subalgebra such that the Hopf algebra is faithfully flat over it, that generalizes affine homogeneous spaces of algebraic groups. So the fact that the cusp is such a thing means that, yeah, it has very few classical symmetries, but it seems to have many quantum symmetries. And at first I thought this is maybe uh, just a coincidence because the ring is so simple. But then Angela started her PhD and I said, well, try the same thing for other curves, such as the nodal cubic. Oh, this is like a small loop. Uh, or the lemnis a figure eight. Yeah, these are all nice small plane curves with such a singularity. And it turned out this works. Um, and so this was the content of Angela's thesis. And with Manuel, I also looked at the Hopf algebra, which acts on the nodal cubic a little bit more and related that to certain quantum groups at roots of unity. Um, but overall, I would say still 10 years on, the picture is completely unclear. Uh, so I would still really love to know if you give me some algebraic set X, some F on variety X, when is this coordinate ring X quantum homogeneous? No idea. We have a few examples, but we have no geometric characterization which says, well, maybe it's true always, or maybe it's only true for curves, or maybe it's true for varieties with a singularity with these and these properties. Who knows? Um, but on this, I think this is a very hard question, I think. Um, so the other question, which in general will also be very hard is, can you classify all the quantum automorphisms of a given Kx? Um, but this is what I return to with blessing. Um, so together we now look at the cusp and we say, okay, there are a few quantum automorphisms which come from this one quantum homogeneous space structures. Um, but with some new ideas, um, I claim that eventually we will be able to classify all of them and find the universal quantum group acting on this. Um, but this is something which is work in progress. My time is up anyway, so I hope I will have the opportunity to tell you this story another time when we can actually meet in person again. Um, and I'll finish here. <laughs>